You're listening to the Tepis Paranormal Talking Point Podcast, a show that discusses various aspects of the paranormal world, with paranormal news, ghost stories, interviews, and much more. And without further ado, let's get into some talking points. Hi guys, Scott here from Tepis Paranormal, and welcome back to another episode of the Tepis Paranormal Talking Point Podcast. Today my guest is Kevin Hines. Kevin is a paranormal investigator, medium and historian who specialises in the city of Plymouth and its surrounding areas. Now Plymouth is of course where I'm from and so I have a keen interest on the local paranormal history as well as the haunted locations within the city and its surrounding areas. Kevin is also an author and has written two books, Haunted Plymouth and Haunted Dartmoor. Both of these books are key parts of my paranormal library. And so having the chance to sit down with Kevin and discuss his paranormal history, his beliefs, what he thinks of some of the haunted locations within the city, as well as talking about writing his books, was a really great experience. So without further ado, please sit back and enjoy the interview. So thank you for joining me. Um, Could you start by introducing yourself a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, My name's Kevin Hines, Um, spiritual medium, also the founder of Haunted Plymouth, uh, author, and paranormal investigator. I'm also a Reiki master, so I'm very much intrigued with the paranormal as a whole, but obviously spiritualism as well. Cool. Okay. Um. So obviously you were born and raised in Plymouth. Yes, I was. Yes. Um, I was as well. So, what would you say is your earliest memory of the paranormal, sort of in the city? Um, in the city. Um. I suppose it was a bit further afield from the city for me, myself. Um, my dad was in the Navy. Um, he was from Ireland. My mother was from Wales. But my dad used to spend time, sometimes weekends, used to take us to Bond Dartmoor, obviously just out of the city a little bit. And my first sort of experience of the paranormal was my mum told me a story about Kitty Jay's grave and also about the hairy hands. And that kind of inspired me, to be honest, in regards to finding out a bit more about the paranormal. I was probably about five, six at the time. And then I remember I purchased my first book. Uh, it was called Devon Ghosts, and I was intrigued from there. In regards to in the city first experience, um, I've investigated many places throughout the country, um, especially in Plymouth as well. So um, I could name a plethora of locations, to be honest. Um, I mean, you've got Real Cinema, you've got um, Devonport Dockyard. So from an investigation point of view, but my earliest childhood memory is probably Dartmoor, to be honest, Scott. Okay, perfect. Um, so... Obviously, as you said, you are an author. Um, you've written Haunted Plymouth and Haunted Dartmoor. Um, yes. I've got both of those books. And oh, thank you. I find them really useful for obviously local sort of paranormal knowledge. There's not, there's not a lot of sort of local information readily available that I tend yeah. to be able to find. So having, you know, all sorts of collected cases from around the city and surrounding areas in one place is really helpful. Yeah. Um, so I must admit, I refer to that quite a bit while doing a lot of, you know, local sort of investigation and history sort of stuff. Um, what would you say is obviously your favourite paranormal investigation that you've done around the country? Around the country? Um, I think that I've kind of put into two categories. I have like my favourite in regards to activity wise how active it was and i got my favorite in regards to locations i like to keep visiting and experiencing Mm -hmm. i suppose for me personally my favorite one um, was actually based in bodmin um there was an old hospital called st lawrence's um it actually closed many years ago and we were given the opportunity to actually investigate the hospital i was with another group at the time and uh, this has gone back to 2004 and for me, it was very active indeed. I mean, we had to be interviewed. The team was interviewed by the NHS um, just to make sure, you know, we had good intentions yeah. and we weren't thrill seeking. And it was very active in regards to activity, um, sightings, audibles, all ticked all the boxes. So that for me, St. Lawrence's was my favorite investigation. And then obviously there's a l- number of places I like to investigate. Um, recently done Craggy Noss up in the Bracken Beacons very active location and then obviously close to home in Plymouth um, we're quite sport obviously Dartmoor loads of locations mm-hmm. but I suppose in Plymouth wise um, 
I did enjoy real cinema. I've done that twice. And I'd like to get in there again, hopefully if it opens again in the near future. So we'll see. Yeah, I must admit it's a shame that that's obviously at the minute, I guess, is it derelict at the minute? Or is it just um, sort I think, of... I think that actually I spoke to someone because I still include it on my ghost walk. And um, I spoke to a gentleman who's actually a caretaker, living caretaker, and mm-hmm. actually looking at refurbishing it, whether it's going to be a music venue I've heard on the cards possibly. Okay. But it'd be cool. nice to get back in there. Cool. Um, so you're a psychic medium? Yes. Yeah. Could you tell a little bit more about that? You know, what that entails, how that works for you? Yeah, of course. Um, so from investigating, I've been investigating for over 20 years of paranormal. And the reason why I got into the mediumship kind of thing is because oh, on one of the first investigations, there was a lady um, using a pendulum. And there was a gentleman used some days and rods. And I was just intrigued, like, what are you doing? And they said, they're speaking to the spirit of a young girl. So I was like, okay. Following day, obviously, I was hooked made myself a pair of days and rods out of an old metal coat hanger as you do and um, from that moment on just intrigued wanted to find out how more i could link in with spirit so i started sitting in circle development circles um it's where you can tune into your intuition um linking with spirit and obviously there's a difference between um mediums and obviously psychics i'm not sure if you're aware um maybe some of your listeners aren't but obviously all mediums are psychic, whereas um, not all psychics are mediums. So the difference between a medium is obviously a medium has that direct link with spirit, whereas a psychic picks upon the vibration, the energies around a person or a location. So all place memory. But as I said, all mediums are psychic. So for me, we're sitting in a circle for over 15 years, developing. Um, and for myself, how I work, I'm clairvoyantly. So I see images more so in the mind's eye, um, clairaudiently, so in the mind's ear and also clairsentient as well. So I sense and feel. So if I'm undertaking a one-to-one reading for a sitter, I would pick up on their loved ones. They would give me images of what they look like. They would pass on messages. And it's all about getting that validation. And obviously as a medium, you want to try and get validation for the sitter to prove that life goes on beyond death. So cool. that's kind of how I work. Okay. Um, so as a medium, have you ever had anything overwhelmingly negative come through um yes uh, on a couple of occasions i always try to work in positivity and light uh, obviously i love investigating the paranormal and when you go to a lot of locations you can imagine like see bobman jail um, various other places you visit you know there'd be could be some tragic circumstances how people have passed and that leaves an imprint as well on the actual location um, we did do a, a documentary a few years ago um, called Encounters, and one of the actual episodes was quite dark. Um, it sort of dabbled into witchcraft and Dartmoor and what goes on still this day and age, the modern modern times. And we'd done one episode there, and it was all about Satanism. It wasn't a nice episode in that regard. It's not something I would normally approach. But yeah, there was something we were picking up on in this one location. And it wasn't very pleasant. And to be honest, it affected me for about four to six months. Um, just didn't feel myself. Um, I always put protection in place, close down, open up, etc. But I, it affected the team. I think it was because of the subject matter more so than anything. And it's something I would never kind of revisit in that regard. But you just got to be aware that you work in positive intent. It's all about power of intention. So if you're looking for something negative, just be mindful. You may actually come across it. For me, it's just trying to link it with spirit see who's around, why they're here, why, what is their story? And that's how I like to work, though. Can they tell us why they're still here? And that's nine times out of ten when you investigate. As you know yourself, Scott, they're just trying to get information across to you why they are still here, why they still haunt a particular space. Yep. Um, so, obviously, what are your favourite methods of investigating? Um, so, investigating, um, I'm a big believer in using, um, obviously, mediumship um because that's kind of where i work from but i also like to use a bit of tech as well and i personally feel that by using tech and mediumship methods work hand in hand so for example if you have a cold spot in a particular area or the medium or myself is picking up on a particular spirit in a relevant place it's important to use the tech as well to say look we're getting this in this area um also you obviously you've got your REM pods as well interact with the REM pods I mean, the days and rods I use occasionally, but it's more so for a visual aid for someone else, the person who's watching, rather than myself, because it's just validating this is the area of interest and picking up on energy lines, ley lines. Okay. 
Um, I think, yeah, like you say, sort of having that, obviously having the mediumship and then having the technical interaction sort of coinciding is obviously something really cool and something that adds a lot of credibility to both. I 100% agree. I think it's important to do that. I mean, we've had one instance, um, funny enough, in real cinema. Um, I think it was back in 2010. Um, my second visit and in the third screen there we interacted with a gentleman he's a farmer and the reason we were still there it was because he used to visit there with his wife it was a place he'd like to go and visit and spend time there and um, we were interacting with him so I had my days of rods I was tracking and moving up and down the aisles and we put um, a number of meters down EMF meters so we had three of them in a row and actually got my days of rods and I pointed the direction where the gentleman was and asked him to move towards me and as he did so uh, these um, K2 meters are quite new out at the time. As he moved towards us, um, these meters are about six foot apart. And as he went past each meter and the rods are tracking in, it set the meter off. So I found that quite intriguing. We're using obviously mediumship methods, those in and tech. Cool. Um, so obviously, while um, you investigate, are there any locations from around the world that sort of appeal to you that you haven't yet been to that you really want to visit are there any sort of standouts oh definitely um i do have a bucket list um for me i think obviously in america there's quite a few locations i'm sure yourself um i would like to obviously salem massachusetts mm -hmm. um also you have um where else are we going to go um trying to think of the name of the hospital as well i do apologize trying to think of the name of the hospital now um, in America, but obviously in this country, Edinburgh, um, I would like to investigate the vaults, something I've been liking to do for a long time. Yeah. Um, in Dublin as well, there's a, an old prison there called Kilmarnham Gaul. Mm -hmm. um, visited there, and I would love to investigate there. Obviously, I don't believe they're open for investigation at the minute. Cool. Um, obviously, travelling around, there are a lot of places that you go to that you don't actually get to investigate. I find, you know, I find when I'm travelling... I'll go somewhere and I'll go to like a pub that I know has got claims of, uh, you know, hauntings from online. But it's one of those not being able to investigate. It's almost like it's teasing you to a degree. Yes. Um, yeah, you get that sometimes. I mean, it's nice because obviously visiting these locations, you get a feel for it. But sometimes I'm quite forward. I will speak to the people, especially if it's a pub um, and say, Look, you know, introduce myself. Just feel the ground, see, you know, see where they stand. But yeah. There are places, you know, National Trust places, English Heritage places, but unfortunately, um, in regards to allowing groups in, as you know yourself, they're quite closed sometimes. Yeah. But also that the cost now to investigate. Back in the day when I first started, probably like yourself, it was quite reasonable, but now, unfortunately, it does cost a lot of money. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I'm finding at the minute costs seem to have increased over sort of the COVID period as well. Sort of since then, everything seems to have gone up quite a bit. Almost um, definitely. So, obviously, you started um, Haunted Plymouth. Yes. And then the ghost walks around Plymouth, around the Barbican and that sort of thing. Could you tell us a little bit about, you know, what led to you starting Haunted Plymouth and starting the ghost walks? Yes. Yeah, so um, I was actually in partnership many years ago with a gentleman who was running ghost walks down in Cornwall. And um, we kind of parted our ways and then I stopped doing the walks and then I decided to set up Haunted Plymouth off my own back. And um, that was in 2009. And it was for the love of Plymouth because obviously born in Plymouth, bred in Plymouth. Um, Plymouth has just got such a wide history and obviously it's fair share of hauntings. And I thought it would be rude not to actually try and keep this alive. And to this day, obviously since 2009, I still undertake the walks. Um, and I just love meeting people, but keeping that haunted history alive. And I always say on the tour, you can't have hauntings and paranormal act activity without actually having history. So I'm a big lover of history as well. And that's kind of what inspired me to keep it going. And obviously off the back of that, I wrote my first book, Haunted Plymouth. Cool. Um, so obviously you say about the history, Plymouth's a old city with a lot of sort of naval history. Um, are there any sort of locations around, particularly from the naval point of view, that stand out to you? Obviously, other than the dockyard, which is the obvious one. Um, I suppose in regards to naval, you have 
trying to think. Obviously, the dockyard, as I wrote about the hangman cell, um, spent time there as well. Um, Drake's Island, um, quite relevant. I've been invited over there last year. I was hosting a couple of tours over there, doing some paranormal nights, days. Um, so I feel that's quite active. Other history-wise, I mean, you do have, obviously, the Tamar. Um, you have a number of pubs. You've got down Sotas Passage. You've got the pub there, the Ferry House Inn. Um, and obviously the River Tamar itself was renowned for smugglers back in the day. So, you know, as you said, in regards to sea seafarers and fishermen and smugglers and pirates, Bear Island as well. We, we're so blessed to be where we're living with all that colourful history and hauntings. Yeah, I think, like you say, I think the fact we're sort of that close to the coast and it's obviously because we're a sort of naval town, we get a lot of sort of visitors which means a lot of stories and a lot of just a variety of people travel here. Yeah, we do. I mean, I always mention on one of, on one place on the tour, um, there's a lane. It's called um, Blackfriars Lane, just behind Plymouth Gin. Mm -hmm. And um, a friend of mine, he's um, quite well in a medium from up country. And I've done a private tour for him. And he was picking up on um, a bit of a gruesome. He was a medium. He's a medium, sorry, I should say as well. And he's actually getting an image of a replay of um, something that occurred in this lane. And um, he was saying to me, it was from when there was someone visiting, obviously, from abroad. Obviously, back in the day, Plymouth was a bustling port, as it is still now, but even more so. And you have people visiting um, the port, spending their money, obviously, having a good time. And um, he's, he was getting the image of a lady over the night. And it was a bit of an altercation. And it was an image was played out in regards to where, unfortunately, she was stabbed. And um, even to this day in that area, on certain nights um, on doing the tour, um, I don't mention it when there's young children, obviously, because I try to make the tour family mm -hmm. friendly. But if there's all adults, I might mention it and see what they get in this area. And we know when it's quite active because certain things are picked up and triggered and people know this as well. Cool. Um, so, obviously, as an investigator, what would you say is the best evidence you've ever captured? Oh, OK. Um you can't beat personal experiences, of course, but sometimes you need that hard evidence. So whether it's um, a recording in regards to audible, um, video, I think on one of the best evidence captured was when we're doing that documentary for Encounters. And um, my colleague, I was obviously the medium walking through, he would then go and investigate the location, spend time there. And there's one particular spot uh, on the investigation is in this tunnel and he had a locked off camera. And the actual camera, the whole camera moved on top of the tripod and he was on the opposite side. Um, he was nowhere near the camera at the time. And that was actual physical movement. And when it took a lot of energy to do this, I found that was fascinating. And like you say, I've seen bits of encounters. He went completely by himself. Yes. Uh, almost did the exact opposite of what people say to do in that instance, which is always go with someone. It's very much yeah. the going in by himself, locking himself down almost. And yeah. that makes things like that obviously so much more, I guess, scary to a degree, because it is that there's no one else there at all. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it really raises that kind of, you know, your adrenaline's up. Um, the chances are in regards to investigating, you know yourself, ideally you should never go alone. I mean, we were close by, but we weren't in the location. Um, what I can say is obviously then the chance of something happening is a bit more singled out he's on his own so we, the idea is to get spirit to interact a bit more yeah. and he definitely got some interaction on that evening cool. and what would you say is the best sort of thing you've experienced i guess yourself not necessarily hard physical evidence but something that you've encountered um for me personally um kitty kitty jay's grave um back in 2007 uh, i don't know if you've ever been to kitty jay scott i've not made it there yet OK, definitely worth visiting up on Dartmoor. And um, I was standing next to the grave looking towards my um, colleagues who were on a, a coffee break. And um, you normally think a lot of the activity would happen around the grave. It was literally I was just standing there looking towards my colleague. And this gentleman appeared, uh, moved, walking at pace, just appeared, this figure. He was wearing light blue overalls, almost like a farm hand. This was about one o'clock in the morning. He appeared walking fast and disappeared. Um, even now, it gives me chills thinking about it because I can still see him, the image. And he was literally physically in front of me. And that was fantastic to see that. And was that just seen by you or were there, you know, other people that saw that? Or was it, it was just that 
that gentleman was just seen by myself because the others were just opposite me where there's a little bit of a parking space. Okay, yeah. um, however, about half an hour later, we were getting other activity and myself and a colleague also saw almost like, I can only describe it as a carrot bag size. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's in the book I wrote about it. And uh, we had my colleague and uh, my other friend in the car. We were facing, to, looking towards a grave. And it's almost like this triangular object just floated behind these two um, female investigators. And one of them sort of like put the hand behind the head as if to say, oh, what was that? And my colleague as well both saw this almost like triangular shape and done a bit of research afterwards. And we got the impression that it was almost like a hood. And we found out there was a lady that was connected to the actual haunting um, called Beatrice Chase. And she was a well-known author up on Dartmoor. And she was actually buried in a Dominican robe, we believe. And we weren't sure if she was actually her showing herself because you had the white hood. So I found that interesting as well. Cool. Um, so obviously that grave, I believe, is quite well known for having flowers appear. Um, yes, it that's is. That's one of the obviously famous stories from the grave. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think, I mean, there's always a lot of legend. And don't get me wrong, I am a believer in the paranormal spirit. Um, I think it's good when you have that legend. But what I find intriguing, there are always flowers there. There's coins, there's trinkets, there's gemstones always left there. Even when we do get a bit of snow upon the walls, which we do, um, you find fresh flowers there the following day. And there's no footprints left behind. Um, legend will feed into this as well and it's just kind of nice that you know this carries on today that people following on with that legend but I do generally feel that is a very active location cool um and I suppose one of the more sort of broad questions is what are your paranormal beliefs um you know what sort of do you, do you have limits in your belief and are there any sort of specific things you believe in or don't believe in that others do? Um, um, as I said, 100% believe in the paranormal. Um, in regards to certain beliefs, I can and I've always been quite upfront about orbs. Um, I do believe, obviously, spirit do make themselves known. It takes a lot for spirit to manifest and obviously orbs are said to be the first stage of manifestation and I appreciate it takes a lot of energy. However, I always look at airborne particles, mists, is it caused by something natural? And that's kind of my approach with the paranormal. You've got to look at all the other explanations and look at things rationally rather than just presume everything is paranormal. Once you've explored all these avenues, then you could look at, you know, that is potentially the unknown. It is um, possibly paranormal. So for me, it's orbs I can be a little bit on the fence with. Um, other beliefs, so from my point of view, I think that's the main one, to be honest. I'm just very, um, with orbs. I mean, I find everything else quite intriguing. Um, EVPs, I find very intriguing indeed, especially when you're calling out and then you're getting actual names that are relevant to what I may have been picking up as well. So I find that fascinating. Okay, perfect. Um, so obviously, as I said earlier, you are a published author. Um, you have both Haunted Plymouth and Haunted Dartmoor. What sort of reception did you find while researching for those what sort of you know reaction from say locations or just asking around did you get um so for me um obviously i've done a lot of investigating in cornwall as a member of a group for many years and i always feel that in cornwall people are very open however i was quite so quietly surprised how open people were also within devon and plymouth and dartmoor um it's kind of nice that the west country people seem to be quite open-minded in that regard um, some people are a bit, you know, oh, I'm not too sure about that. But what normally happens, you probably experience yourself, Scott. You explain, you know, your background and your beliefs, and in regards to the paranormal investigating, people have a bit of a joke, bit of a bit of banter, as they call it. However, ten minutes later, they come back up to you and they say, "So I'm curious, you know, you know, what what does happen? What have you experienced?" So it's kind of that intrigue, that draw. So for me, researching the books, a lot of people were quite forthcoming and, you know, very polite, actually. I didn't really have any negativity towards me in that regard. Cool. Okay, yeah, because I've spoken to a couple of other people in the past that have uh, done research for books. Um, so I interviewed Jeff Belanger. The, yes, Jeff. Um, yeah. Obviously, he does a lot of ghost adventures, or he's the researcher for that. And he said that, in America specifically, he finds a lot of people are quite 
reserved and very, you know, you ask a question about the paranormal, you very much get a, uh, we don't talk about that kind of answer. And yeah. I guess that's almost the sort of more religious elements of a lot of America. Um, and, you know, it's almost, I guess it's almost frowned upon to talk about that kind of thing, whereas here, I suppose, we're a bit more open. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a big thing. I'm very conscious and I do respect everyone else's beliefs. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that, you know, for me personally, I shouldn't be forcing my beliefs onto anyone because we'll have free will, obviously. And I think in regards to America, I know I respect that as well. Um, in regards to religion and people's beliefs, obviously, you've got to be very careful how you approach things. And I appreciate what you're saying, what Jeff's saying as well, because, um, you know, you don't want to cause upset. That's the last thing you want to do. It's that respect, I think. Cool. Um, I think that brings us to the end of all the questions I had. Is there anything sort of specific you want to add? Um, no, I'm, I mean, I'm happy with that. Thank you. Cool. Perfect. So with that, I'll end it there. Um, thank you so much for joining me. I'll put links to obviously your website, socials and all that in the description of the uh, YouTube version of this when it goes out. And yeah, thank, you, thank you for joining me. And you're more than welcome to join me on a tour as well, as I said, uh, perfect. on my guests. So anytime you want to come on. Thank okay, you. Okay, perfect. And once again, I'd like to give a big thanks to Kevin for taking the time to join me for this interview. Kevin runs regular ghost walks within Plymouth, and I'll put links in the description of the YouTube version of the podcast, as well as linking his website so that you can find out more about Kevin and his social media so that you can contact and follow him to see what else he's up to. I'll also put links to Kevin's books in case you want to buy a copy. If there are any guests you'd like me to have on the podcast, please let me know and I'll see if I can reach out. And for now, I've been Scott from Tepper's Paranormal. And I'll see you in the next episode.